So let's have a look. So number one, the discrete random variable x can only take the values of one, two, three, and four. Now for this one, the cumul cumulative distribution function is defined by the following. So we've got fx equals kx squared for x equals one, two, three, and four. So essentially what this means is that it's probably comfortable with always do this is to draw a cumulative distribution function over here and simply just um, put your values for x which is one two three and four and start plugging in into the question for example when x is one you can have k times one squared and that gives you k so the response here would be k plug in two you get two squared which is four so you get four k and so on and eventually you get up to 16k one property of the cumulative distribution function is that the final value of, of the cumulative distribution represents all the properties summed up to get this. So essentially 16k equals the sum of all the properties up to 16k. So that means this is essentially equal to 1. So A, find the value k, well k is 1 over 16. Because either A, you add up the properties, or, or B, you make this equal to 1. Now, now for the next question, I had to find the property distribution of x. And to do this, um, lay out, lay down your pro, your your x values from one, two, three, and four, and now we just need to think about it in relative to the cumulative distribution. For example, to get the first value for 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 f x, if we assume that we have f x equals k, f one equals k, that means because this is the fir very first term value, this means that the very first property is also k. Okay, this this is all properties summed up to one. There is none before it, and the only one we had is k, so it's k. As for the second one. By the time you reach the second property for cumulative, you would have summed up the first two probabilities. So adding up the first two will make 4k, meaning this would be 3k, because 4k minus k is 3. And next one, to get to 3, it would be 9 minus 4, which is 5k, and 60 minus 9 is 7k. And yeah, that's it guys, that's literally how you, cut, you calculate the probabilities from all of this. And to make sure this is right, if you add up all of these k's, you must get 16k. And done. That's literally done. Question two, correlation and regression. So here I've done this over two slides. So we're going to go through each step, step by step to understand every result. Now, starting from the top, question two. So Paul believes that there is a relationship between the value and the floor size of a house. He takes a random sample of 20 houses and records the value given in V pounds and the floor size in S meter squared. So we've got two random variables, V and S. Now the data were coded using x equals s minus 50 over 10 and y equals v over 100,000 and we're given the following statistics. So they're giving us all the x and y statistics or at least uh, most of them. Now the first one is a find the value s x y and value s x x. Now these are just standard. s x y is defined as, as the following. You're given this in the formula book so don't worry but for purpose, for at least for result purposes I put them up here. Now to get these results, SXY, you just plug in the XY value, which is um, 1474, and you plug in the sum of X and sum of Y's, which are given here. And you divide it by N. In this case, N represents 20 houses. Pl plug in the calculator, you should get the following result. And then repeating SXX, you use SX squared minus the sum of X times sum of X, or the sum of X all squared over N. And doing the same thing, you get that result. And that's it. Now for part B, they want us to find the equation of the least squares regression line of y on x. In other words, we need to find y equals a plus bx, the standard linear regression line. And to do this, uh, we need to first calculate what a and b is. Now thankfully, we're also given these formulas. Here we need to note that a equals y bar minus b times x bar. y bar means the mean of y and x bar means the mean of x. To calculate y bar, it's going to be the sum of y over n n being 20 so 59.8 over 20 would be y bar and x bar would be 441.5 sum of x over n so over 20. Now before you do that you need to first work out b and to get b we just use our results from part a which is sxy over sxx. Divide this and you should get a value of 0 0.102. Plug into the first equation you get a equals 0 0.746 and done. You can therefore say that your regression line y equals a plus bx where a is going to be 0 0.746 and b 0 0.102 and that's it you have an equation in terms of x done so that's a and b done now let's look at the next two so it states here that the least squares regression line of v on s so again this is kind of a play on the previous equation and the coding is v equals c plus ds 
Now, show that D equals 1020 to three significant figures and find the value C. This is easy. All you have to do is just realize that we're talking that we're using the, our original y equation and we're just substituting the value for y given in the coded part as v over 100,000. So replace y with v over 100,000 and replace x with s minus 50 over 10 from the top. Now all you have to do is just literally tidy this up. So what I did here is that I just, you know, firstly expanded the bracket, solved it. And when you expand all this and oh yeah, by the way, it cut off over here. When you expand this and collect like terms and times everything by 100,000, you should get basically V equals 23,600 plus 1,020 S. This is just algebra. This is just expanding the bracket and collecting like terms. Okay, that's easy. Now D, estimate the value of a house with floor size 130. One thing to know about this question is that you're just plugging in a value. So the floor size is 130. If we look back at the top of the first paragraph, it states that the floor size is given by S. So just replace S from part C with 130. So you get 23,600 plus 1,020 times 130. And you should get this result. 156,200 156, pounds. Okay, all good. Now let's move on to the next slide. So E. Interpret, so let me move this up. So interpret the value of D. Oh, interpret the value of D. So D actually came from the previous question. It's this D here for the DS. So this D we got was 1020. And just understanding the context of this question, this is just a relation between houses, the value of the houses and the floor size. So D is next to S. And I said here that for every unit of the floor size, the value of the house increased by 1020. So literally for every square meter added, your house increases by exactly 1,020 pounds. If they ask you to find the value of um, C or A in this case of C, you will say that the initial value of the house is 23,600 pounds or the constant value of the house is 23,600 pounds. So as long as you, so as long as it's like that. Now, last part. So Paul wants to increase the value of his house. He decides to add an extension to increase the floor size by 31 meters squared. Now notice how he said this. He wants to increase the floor size by 31 meters squared. So all he wants to do is take this S and increase by 31. And so he's going to write S plus 31. So our new variable is here, S plus 31. Now, for, now this one is quite okay. All you have to do now is literally expand this and collect like terms. So expand this, you get 1020S plus and then multiply by 31 and then add it to the original you get 55,000 and so on so that's easy easy maths now it says here is to estimate the increase in the value of the house after adding the extension well if you com if you compare this this new v equation to the original equation here you can see that the value from 23,600 has increased to this and the increase is you just subtract it and you get 31,620 done that's literally all you have to do. So a company employs 90 administrators. The length of time that they have been employed by the company and their gender are summarized in the table below. So over here, again, I've, as usual, I've done all the results in advance of time. So all I want to do is explain every single result. Now, the length of time is given by the X year. So X less than four, the years between four and 10 or years greater than 10. And you've got males and females. Now let's 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 do this step by step. So one of the 90 administrators is selected at random. So only one person, yep. Find the probability that the administrator is female. Well, that's easy. All you do is look at the female column. So it could be any female, so it could be 9 plus 14 plus 7. And we know it's out of 90 people, so it'll just be all of these over 90, which is 30 over 90 or one third. Both works. Now B. Now, given that the administrator has been employed by the company for less than four years, so when you use the term given that, we're interested in the area. So that's going to be our total value for the, for the bottom. So given that the, the administrator has been employed for less than four years, so less than four years implies that the area is now out of nine and six, so it's out of 25 candidates, so nine and 16. Find the property that this person was male. So out of 9 and 16, the male person, there were 16 of them. So it would be 16 over 9 plus 16. And then you can simplify that. So the cool thing about given that is, is, is that we usually use the shrunken method. 
we only select one of the variables or, or at least some of the variables from the bottom half of the fraction. Now C, given that the administrator has been employed by the company for less than 10 years, so let's pause there. So less than 10 years refers to these two columns because this is less than four and this is between four and 10. So essentially less than 10 means both of them. So these are all the candidates. So these are all the number of people that was less than 10 years. So we've got nine, 16, 40, and 20. So that'll be our area underneath. Now find the property that this administrator is male. So being male, out of these four people, these four um, groups is gonna be 16 and 20. And that's it, you just put it on the top line and simplify. Now last one, D. State with a reason whether or not the event selecting a male is independent of the event selecting an administrator who has been employed by the company for less than four years. All right, so, so this one, not too bad, but we need to think about what it means here. The term independent is usually the common power, pop, the, the multiplication rule. In the S1 book, you'll be familiar with this one. Independence means that the intersection between A and B must equal the independent probabilities A and B. If this, if you get the same results on both sides, we say they are independent. Now let's do it like that. So selecting male, let's call it M. And selecting someone that who is employed for less than four years, let's call X less than four. So we're looking at this column and we're looking at M. So the probability of, of, of getting a male is literally any of these options, 16, 20, and 24. So it'll be 60 if you add them up out of 90. The probability of, of um, administrator being less than, who's worked for less than four years is anyone from the first row, 9 to 16, so it's 25 people out of 90. So doing that, you should get 5 out of 27. Now, if you're doing the intersection rule, we need to see now the probability of M intersecting less than four years. So if you're male and you did less than four years, that, that, that counts for exactly 16 people, so 16 out of 90. Now, now solving this, you get A of 45 and you realize that the probabilities are different. So this implies that they are not independent at all. And that's it. Okay guys, question four. So a bag contains 19 red beads and one blue bead only, so 20 in total. Now Linda selects a bead at random from the bag and she notes his color and replaces the bead in the bag. So she replaces it, meaning we still have 20 beads altogether. Once you take one, put it back in. She then selects the second bead at random from the bag and notes his color. Now, as you can see, I've already got all the answers out. And what, again, as usual, I'm going to go ahead and explain every single result and, and also explain optimal ways to do it too. So let's do each one. So A. So find a property that both beads selected are blue. So this is stand, This is quite standard. So you've got one blue bead and, you've got, and this is out of 20. So it'll be one out of 20 for the first bead and you put it back in the bag. So the second bag is going to have one out of 20 again. So 1 out of 20 times 1 out of 20, 1 over 400. Now, next one, find a property that exactly one bead selected is red. Now, to get exactly one red, this means you need to have combinations. This means the first one needs to be red and the second one needs to be blue. So that makes exactly one red in total. Or you could have done the other way around. You could have the blue being the first bead and the red being second. Either way, this means exactly one bead in either scenario. Now, all you do is literally calculate its probabilities. So what I've also done, I've written two ways. This means that you can pretty much write this in two different ways. So your result would be whatever probabilities you calculate for one, then you just have to double it, just times it by two. So property again, red bead first is 19 over 20, put it back in the bag. Property again, blue is one over 20. So just evaluate this, double it, and you should get 19 over 200. <coughs> okay, yeah, I do sound kind of sick today. So next one guys, yeah? <coughs> So in another bag, there are nine beads. So four of which are green and the rest are yellow. So I just put five on top. So we've got four green and five yellow. Now according to this one, Linda selects three beads from this bag at random without replacement. So here is the key buzzword. Without replacement means is that when she takes out the bead, she's not gonna put it back in the bag. So, it's, so from nine, the next one will be out of eight and out of seven and six and so on. So you're gonna have less beads every time. So let's, let's think about this. C. So find the probability that two of these beads are yellow and one is green. So you need two yellows and one green. So if we look over here, we need to write down combinations. So what I did is that I put as many combinations as I could think of. So you can have you can firstly take out two yellows and a green, or you could take out yellow, green, and yellow, or green, yellow, yellow. Either way, if you calculate probabilities for all of these, you're going to get the same combination of values. So what I do is just I calculate for one of them. 
So, so for example, getting yellow first would be 5 out of 9. Getting yellow again would be 4 left out of 8 left now. And again, green, we've got 7 all together. And 4 of them are green, so 4 sevens. So you just put this, multiply by 3 because there's 3 different ways to organize it. And then you should get a result of 10 over 21 in your calculator. So that's cool. Okay, now here comes like the big boss. And there's two ways to solve this. And I realize it's right at the end. <laughs> So Linda replaces the three Bs and then selects another four at random without replacement. So what this means is that she, the three Bs she took from part C, she puts it back in the bag. So now we have nine Bs again. So now we're going to find the probability of picking four at random without replacement. So same process. So now it's going to go down to six basically. So find the probability that at least one of the Bs is green. Now what this means at least one of the green, it means that you could either have one green or more so you get one green or two greens or three greens or all greens now this one's quite lengthy but what I did here is that firstly you find the probability of one combination so you can have green yellow yellow but then you can but like the black like C, you can organize in four different ways you could have yellow green yellow 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 green yellow or yellow 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 green so it's so what you could just say is times by four a cool way in your calculator is that you have the choose button, this 4C button. You can say that because you want one green, you could say 4 choose 1 green. And, and the calculator gives you 4. In your calculator, and then, yeah, when you do that, you can just list down the probabilities. So again, the green would be 4 knives. Yellow, 4 A's because you've got 5 yellows. And it's going down to 8. Then you take another yellow, you've got 4. And another yellow, you get 3. And the probabilities are descending. Now for the second one, Again, you want two greens and you want three greens. So to get two greens, to find all the combinations, put in your calculator, you've got four different options and you just want to choose two greens. So four choose two should give us six. And again, list out the probabilities similar to the first. So four of nine and another green makes it three. Now we want a yellow, so five, another yellow, four. And then same for the third one, you want three greens and a yellow. And there's um, four choose three ways to do this. And finally, four greens. So do this all, add it up and you'll finally get 121 over 126 yeah however <laughs> and trust me i was a bit silly one thing i realized is that instead of doing this long way which is 15 different ways by the way you could just find the probability of obtaining all yellows because if you check that out realize that if you if you want something that's at least one green you're actually covering every different option the only option you're missing is four yellows because that has zero greens so if you calculate the probability of four yellows using this method then you could just simply one minus this result and this will give you the same answer because essentially this is the only property that was not included so if you one minus this you get all of these so yeah <laughs> so sorry i didn't tell you guys that earlier but that is another way to calculate this for future reference i usually stick to the classic method but totally up to you measure the speed of cars passing a particular point on a motorway now the random variable x is the speed of a car so here we define x as the normal distribution of mean 55 miles per hour. So right off the bat, before I even look at a and b, firstly, let's write down the distribution, which is x is normally distributed with mean 55. Now this 20 came from a later question, which is over here, it has a standard deviation of 20. And it's okay, you can put that there because it doesn't affect any question either way. Now, let's start a. So firstly, draw a sketch to illustrate the distribution of x. Label the mean on your sketch. So first, so first things first, this is just a standard normal distribution, so get your bell curve out. So draw a nice simple bell curve and then draw a line cutting through the center and that will be your mean 55. And that's it, you're done. This extra information is for part B, so you can ignore that. So it's just a red, it's just a red part only. Easy two marks. Now, next one. The speed limit on the motorway is 70 miles per hour. Now car drivers can choose to travel faster than the speed limit but risk losing being caught by the police. So this is indicating that if you go faster than 70, you'll be over here. Now the distribution of x has a standard deviation of 20, so we can put 20 there, so sigma is 20. Now b, find the percentage of cars that are traveling faster than the speed limit. So all we care about is that we want to find the probability that x is greater than 70 because 70 represents the speed limit and anything greater is of course uh, the region of interest this is uh, of course the, the resolved answer so when you do property x greater than 70 we have to instantly convert this to the z form now what i did here is that i did firstly to convert to z it's going to be um, the following let me just quickly get my pen it's going to be 
70 minus the mean which is 55 over sigma which is 20 and resulting this you should get 0 0.75 and that's it now this equals to one and then the thing of this question is that once you have the z value here you realize that the table value only records um, the left hand side so property z less than equals z so we want the left hand side of the distribution and to get this um, we have to pretty much reflect this so if it's greater than it'll be one minus the less than counterpart so z greater than 0 0.75 on the distribution it will look a bit like this so instead of seven, instead of the mean being 55 on the z it'll be zero instead of 70 it'll be 0 0.75 so this is the region of interest so we want to do one minus the left hand side the white part this will give us this area so we do one minus the left side and now we can get the table value because the left side is in the table so let's have a look at the table then and see how we get this result so 0 0.75 here is over here and this gives us a table value, a probability of 0 0.7734. Plug in over there, and then if you one minus this, you get 22.66%. Or in the marketing, you can just keep it 22.7%. That's it. Now let's move on. So the fastest 1% of cars will be banned from driving. Okay, so fastest 1%, you're talking about literally the, the end the end points of the tail. Okay. Now C. Show that the lowest speed corrected three sim figures for a car driver to be banned is 102 miles per hour. Show you working clearly. Now, in this case, they already gave us the results 102. So what, what I did is I just called it D. And I realized if you want to be at the top 1%, you have to be at the edge of the tail. So you imagine we did a line over here and just called it D. That's exactly what we're trying to find out. So just line D, we'll find that little small area here, which is, which is equivalent to 1% okay so you can just say property x is greater than d and that equals one percent and now all we do is convert this to the z form which is over here so i did d minus the mean which is 55 over 20 and all of this must equal one percent now all we do is look at the table for the great because now this is in the greater form we can use the percentage tables the percentage tables lets us check that out which is here okay and over here we can just simply find one percent and here's one percent it's literally 2.363 so this means that the value z here the area or this value z is now equivalent to 2.3263 so this means we can just equate this to here and now we can just calculate for d so that's it guys i mean this is it so when you make when you when you make all this equal to 2.3263 you just simply solve to find this value so just in case you're not sure it looks a bit like this so D minus 55 over 20 equals 2.3263. Now you just times 20 across, add 55 and boom, 1 or 2 miles per hour. You're in the top 1%. Yeah, not bad. Oof. Yeah, so actually I'm fasting today, guys. So that's why I sound a bit, bit knackered. But I hope you're enjoying it so far because we've got one more to go. Well, and more after that. Now, next one. So car drivers will... It will just be given a caution if they are traveling at speed m such that and this is the probability distribution where x is between 17 m so looking at this graphically i mean we know that the mean is uh what was the mean the mean was 55 so that's the center bit so center bit is 55 so we know that 70 is above the mean and we're trying to find some area between 17 m okay so that's how it looks visually so it's always good to draw a graph now to work out this area and to make it into simple probabilities like these Think of the, think of it like this. We want to find the area which is less than m, so literally the whole the whole region less than m minus the region less than seventy. And, and what that means is that now this part cuts off, and you're just left with this small interval here from seventy to m. And that's essentially this less property x less than m all the way across minus the first seventy will give you that small region. And of course, this is all equal to point one three one five because that's the question. Now, calculate each one. So the tip is, is to always calculate one of them, the numbered one, solve it and then put it to the other side and then evaluate and solve the, the M version using the tables. So property X less than 70. Well, we have this from part A. It's over, where is it? It's, oof, oh, I'm lost. Yes, it's, it's, it's uh, actually it's on part B. We found property X greater than 70. So it's gonna be, when we said it's 22.66, 
So the answer is going to be 0 0.7734 because that's the left hand side. So less than 70B, 0 0.7734. So that's this result. Now, plus this to the other side, you can get 0 0.9049. And all you have to do now is convert this is x less than m to the standard normal, the z form. So it'll be z less than m minus the mean over sigma, standard deviation. Again, equal to the same probability. Now finally, all we need to do is find what is the value this that corresponds to the probability of 0 0.9049. So on the tables we go, let's find 9049. So lose the big table. So 9049 is here and we can see that the equivalent Z value is 1.31. So this means all of this area equals 1.31. And just like the previous one, we just now say that M minus 50 over 20 must equal 1.31. And we solve it and we get M equals 76. Okay, here we go, guys. So, police measure the speed of cars passing a particular point on a motorway. Now, the random variable x is the speed of a car. So, here we define x as the normal distribution of mean 55 miles per hour. So, right off the bat, before I even look at a and b, firstly, let's write down the distribution, which is x is normally distributed with mean 55. Now this 20 came from a later question, which is over here, it has a standard deviation of 20. And it's okay, you can put that there because it doesn't affect any question either way. Now, let's start A. So firstly, draw a sketch to illustrate the distribution of X. Label the mean on your sketch. So first, so first things first, this is just a standard normal distribution, so get your bell curve out. So draw a nice simple bell curve and then draw a line cutting through the center and that will be your mean, 55. And that's it, you're done. This extra information is for part B, so you can ignore that. So it's just a red, it's just the red part only. Easy two marks. Now, next one. The speed limit on the motorway is 70 miles per hour. Now, car drivers can choose to travel faster than the speed limit, but risk losing being caught by the police. So this is indicating that if you go faster than 70, you'll be over here. Now, the distribution of X has a standard deviation of 20, so we can put 20 there. So sigma is 20. Now, B, find the percentage of cars that are traveling faster than the speed limit. So all we care about is that we want to find the probability that X is greater than 70 because 70 represents the speed limit and anything greater is, of course, the region of interest. This is, of course, the, the resolved answer. So when you do probability X greater than 70, we have to instantly convert this to the Z form. Now, what I did here is that I did firstly, to convert to Z, it's going to be um, the following. Let me just quickly get my pen. It's going to be 70 minus the mean, which is 55, over sigma, which is 20. And resulting this, you should get 0 0.75. And that's it. Now, this equals to 1. And then the thing of this question is that once you have the Z value here, you realize that the table value only records um, the left-hand side. So property Z less than equals Z. So we want the left-hand side of the distribution. And to get this, um, we have to pretty much reflect this. So if it's greater than, it'll be one minus the less than counterpart. So Z greater than 0 0.75. On the distribution, it will look a bit like this. So instead of seven, instead of the mean being 55, on the Z, it'll be zero. Instead of 70, it'll be 0 0.75. So this is the region of interest. So we want to do one minus the left hand side, the white part. This will give us this area. So we do one minus the left side. And now we can get the table value because the left side is in the table. So let's have a look at the table then and see how we get this result. So 0 0.75 here is over here. And this gives us a table value, a probability of 0 0.7734. Plug in over there. And then if you want minus this, you get 22.66%. Or in the marks team, you can just keep it 22.7%. That's it. Now let's move on. So the fastest 1% of cars will be banned from driving. Okay, so fastest 1%, so you're talking about literally the, the, end, the end points of the tail. Okay. Now C, show that the lowest speed corrected three same figures for a car driver to be banned is 102 miles per hour. Show you're working clearly. Now, in this case, they already gave us the results 102. So what, what I did is I just called it D. And I realized if you want to be... In the top one percent you have to be at the edge of the tail so you imagine we do the line over here and just call it d that's exactly what we're trying to find out so just line d we'll find that little small area here which is which is equivalent to one percent 
okay so you can just say property x is greater than d and that equals one percent and now all we do is convert this to the z form which is over here so i did d minus the mean which is 55 over 20 and all of this must equal one percent now all we do is look at the table for the great because now this is in the greater form we can use the percentage tables the percentage tables lets us check that out which is here okay and over here we can just simply find one percent and here's one percent it's literally 2.363 so this means that the value z here the area or this value z is now equivalent to 2.3263 so this means we can just equate this to here and now we can just calculate for d so that's it guys i mean this is it so when you make when you when you make all this equal to 2.3263 you just simply solve to find this value so just in case you're not sure it looks a bit like this so d minus 55 over 20 equals 2.3263 now you just times 20 across add 55 and boom one or two miles per hour you're on the top one percent yeah not bad Oof. yeah so actually i'm fasting today guys so that's why i sound a bit bit knackered but i hope you're enjoying it so far because we've got one more to go well and more after that now next one so car drivers will will just be given a caution if they are traveling at speed m such that and this is the probability distribution where x is between 70 and m so looking at this graphically i mean we know that the mean is uh what was the mean the mean was 55 so that's the center bit so center base 55 so we know that 70 is above the mean and we're trying to find some area between 70 and m okay so that's how it looks visually so it's always good to draw a graph now to work out this area and to make it into simple probabilities like these think of the, think of it like this we want to find the area which is less than m so literally the whole the whole region less than m minus the region less than 70 and, and what that means is that now this part cuts off and you're just left with this small interval here from 70 to m and that's essentially this less property x less than m all the way across minus the first 70 will give you that small region and of course this is all equal to 0 0.1315 because that's the question now calculating each one so the tip is is to always calculate one of them the numbered one solve it and then put it to the other side and then evaluate and solve the, the m version using the tables so property x less than 70 well we have this from part a it's over where is it it's oh, i'm lost yes it's out it's, it's uh, actually it's on part b we found property x greater than 70 so it's going to be when we say it's 22.66 so the answer is going to be 0 0.7734 because that's the left hand side so less than 70 b 0 0.7734 so that's this result now plus this to the other side you can get 0 0.9049 and all you have to do now is convert this x less than m to the standard normal to z form so be z less than m minus the mean over sigma standard deviation again equal to the same probability now finally all we need to do is find what is the value this that corresponds to probability of 0 0.9049 so on the tables we go let's find 9049 so use the big table so 9049 is here and we can see that the equivalent z value is 1.31 so this means all of this area equals 1.31 and just like the previous one we just now say that m minus 50 over 20 must equal 1.31 and we solve it and we get m equals 76 so let's have a look so the random variable x has a discrete uniform distribution and takes values 1 2 3 and 4 now before we do even a property distribution i want to take a pause there and realize what does it mean by discrete so if something is a discrete uniform and because it's uniform this means that each of these values have an equal probability so because you've got four things that means all four of them are going to have a probability of one quarter each because they're all equal because they're all uniform that's the key word there so of course before this so make a nice table one two three four and write the following probabilities of a quarter now let's do the questions so find firstly part a the cumulative value at point three f3 where fx is the cumulative distribution function of x so this means for f3 it means you're going to accumulate all the all the properties up until point three so quarter plus quarter plus quarter meaning it's going to be three quarters this next one's easy the expected value so expected value just means that you're going to take the sum of 
each of the, of the of the product of these probabilities so you can do one times a quarter plus two times a quarter and so on all the way up to four times a quarter so i did it here so one times a quarter and so on and you should get 2.5 now to find the variance first things first we need to find the second moment because the general variance equation is a bit like this it's actually um, let me find some space it's ex squared minus ex squared minus the mean squared yeah so this is the second moment minus the mean squared and we find this one from part b so let's calculate ex squared and then see if we get the variance so the ex squared is like this instead of x we need an x squared value so we need to make it like a like a an extra table call it x squared square each of these values so you have one squared two squared three squared and four squared and now we just multiply this against the probability. So you can have one squared times a quarter plus two squared times a quarter, all the way up to four squared times a quarter. And evaluating this, 7.5. So therefore the variance is gonna be the second moment minus the mean squared and boom, 7.5 minus the mean squared, 2.5 squared is five fourths. All right, nice. So that's easy. Now guys, so let's read the next one. So the random variable y has a discrete uniform distribution. So like the first set statement is the same. So it means all these prob all these values have equal probability. So what I would do, so where k is a constant. So write down the probability, probability of y equal y for y being 3, 3 plus k and so on. Now like I said before, this is uniform distribution. So this means everything has equal probability, meaning they all accord to each. So what... What I would personally do is write this as a table. I would call this one y and property y. I will list down all the values of y. So it could be 3, 3 plus k and so on. And write a quarter for each one. This, usually this is really helpful for some, some parts. Some, so at least many parts of the questions. Now, um, where are we? So D. So write down. Okay. So D, write down. Um, okay, we've done that. So the relationship between x and y may be written in the form y equals kx plus c, where c is a constant. Okay, so find the variance of y in terms of k. Now to calculate the variance, we're given the y equation, so essentially you could just find the variance of this ex expanded form. So variance of, a a of kx plus c. Well, I'm starting a lot today. <laughs> so expanding this out. Using the variance property, when you have a term next to the, to the x, you pull it out when you square it. So you have k squared times variance x. When you have a constant on its own, the variance of a constant is zero. The reason why is because the spread of a fixed number is nothing. Because you can't have a spread of something that is fixed. Only something that is random, like x. Because x can take many values. So that's zero. So then you just write k squared times var x. Var x we calculate as 5 over 4, so it's essentially going to be 5 over 4 times k squared. And there it is. Now, last step and, and we're almost done. F. So express c in terms of k. Okay, so in this case, um, you could do two ways. You could pretty much um, take the variance of all of these. By in other words, taking the mean of everything. And then the second moment and then equating it to this solution to find... Um, and make c the subject or you can make your life much easier and just um, realize that these two distributions x and y are related because it tells you the relationship between x and y can be written in this form so what i did here and this one took me a while i'm not gonna lie i was a bit confused i said when x equals one y equals three because i've noticed that there seems to be some sort of arithmetic pattern here so this is kind of weird to be put in a question in, in this s1 paper x values are going up in ones y values are going up in k's so when x is 1, y is 3. So I plug this in into this equation, and then somehow I got c equals 3 minus k. I did the same using x equals 2, and that represents, and since that goes over 1 unit, this must go by k units. So I plug this in, and again, I got 3 minus k. So yeah, I mean, then to be honest, when I look at it this way, it does seem logical that that, that is pretty much this, the statement that needs to be done. But anyway, guys, I hope this helped, and... Um, let me know if you've got any questions. Otherwise, I shall see you soon. Ciao. So, for this kind of question, I actually cropped out most of the information because, to to be frank, this is quite straightforward and um, it's good to just have a look at the key points over here and just to use the relevant stuff. So, let's check out part A. So, first things first, we need to draw a scatter diagram of these data on axes provided. 
And all right, so we got B and P. So B, I believe, was blood pressure or BMI, and P was probably pressure, one of them. Now, this is easy. You just follow the B axis, the X axis. So, for example, for point A, we'll put 32 across. And notice that these blocks are going up in twos. So we've got 32 here, and it's going to go up all the way up to 18. So it's here. Same thing for the rest. So you're going to be plotting all of these points, which is very straightforward. And now the main thing to notice is that when we get to point H, is that H is completely off. If you mean, if you look at the P value, it's extremely high. So this one is what we call an outlier. So I'm just going to label the second, and this one came all the way over here. So that's how it looks. And just FYI, this is all from the mark scheme, yeah. So at least <laughs> I can definitely say that this one is 100% correct. Now let's look at the next following bits. So the doctor decides to leave out patient H from his calculations. So give the reasons for the doctor's decision. Well, given that H is over here, we can clearly say this is an outlier. So any point that falls way off the mark, we call it an anomaly or an outlier. So it doesn't fit the general trend. And usually, or depending, sometimes the data can be included or excluded from calculations. Okay, let's move on. So for the seven patients, A, B, C, D, E, F, and G, so excluding H, the following statistics were given. So we got SPB, SPP, and SBB. Okay. Now find the product moment correlation coefficient R for these seven patients. So the R value is very standard to calculate. Usually we use it with SXY and SXX. In this case, um, for the for R, we're going to treat B as X and P as Y. So I put the equation up here and I solved it. So it'll be R equals SBP, and that cropped out, over the square root of SPP and SBP, SBB. <laughs> BB. So plug all these values in and you should get a value of roughly positive 0 0.81. So this indicates, so when a value is like this, if it's close to one, it, we call it a strong positive correlation. <clears throat> so it's quite a strong correlation. So this is actually the value here. And if you look carefully, it does look like a strong correlation since all the values are very close to each other. So extremely positive. Now, finally, D, without any further calculations, state how R would differ from your answer in part C. Now, this is not too, this is either you understand or you don't. So with an outlier, if an outlier is um, included, this automatically kind of ruins the, the flow of the, of the points. So the correlation will be actually reduced. It will probably reduce closer to zero. I mean, it won't be zero, but it will, the value will be reduced. All because that this anomaly does not fit the pattern. If this anomaly was, however, somewhere over here, it may even get, the, the correlation might increase. So whatever point is closer to the line, at least if it's close to the general line, then the correlation would increase and will fit to it. In this case, the correlation might slightly bend across and be like this. Or perhaps it might even get worse and have no correlation. So anyway, that's, the histogram that's figure yeah. summarizes the times in minutes that 200 people spent shopping in the supermarket. Now, this information is useful because it tells us that 200 people, which is the frequency, is equivalent to the area of all of these blocks. All of these blocks equals 200. Okay, for those who are unsure, a frequency inside is always the area of the block. So we've got frequency here, F, we've got the height, which is the frequency density, and the width, which is the class width. So FD, class width, and frequency density. So you've got it here, and this, this X axis is the class width. So it's always base times height to find the area of the block. Now, give a reason to justify the use of a histogram to represent this data. Now, for this one, I say that we can use a histogram if the data is continuous. So that's what it is. So usually, or not usually, always, that there must never be any gaps. Sometimes you're given a question with no, with some gaps. So usually we'd have to find um, some sort of midpoint between the two values. Here there's no gaps. And you can see it's 11 to 21. So data is continuous all the way across. So it's always in an interval. Okay. Now, given that 40 people spent 11 and 21 minutes, so that's the first block here, shopping in a supermarket, so the first block has an area of 40, so just like I wrote. Estimate the number of people that spent between 18 and 25 minutes shopping in the supermarket. So 18, 25 minutes is, is very specific. Here we need to split this block across, so we need to find like this kind of area. 
and then 25 minutes we need to split this as well to find this kind of area so from here to here now to do this um you'll notice that all these values here the ones in blue were not given so to, to like before we solve anything we need to actually figure out how we got these values so first things first looking at this block one more time this 40 block we can calculate literally the height of it and when you calculate the height boom it's game over so the class width here is 10 between 11 and 21 the class width is 10 we know the area is 40 so to find the height 40 divided by 10 gives us 4 once you calculate the height of 4 you can of course deduce the rest of these by counting the blocks carefully and notice that this has a height of 6 7.2 and 8 and so on and 3 and and whatnot so now that we've got the height of 4 this is useful because now we can just take a semi interval of this since we're finding you know 1825 we can firstly do 18 to 21 and that gives you a width of 3 and because the height is 4 3 by 4 is 12 so that counts for 12 people now up to 25 we want 21 to 25 right so counting from 21 to 25 that has a width of 4 and a vertical height of 6 because the height is 6 and 4 times 6 is 24 and that's it so 4, 12 plus 24 gives us 36 people in that time interval so the answer would be 36 all right so that's the main bit done the hardest bit i guess now the median is very straightforward to calculate the median when we have 200 people we half it and we get we need therefore find the hundredth person in this 200 instead of 200. now i use a very cool method known as the linear interpolation and the way we do this is that first things first i can do step by step again i draw a line across i label the middle part m and represent this as 100. Now all I do here is I look back at the table, at least, well, the histogram, and I have to calculate where does where does a hundred person lie between what blocks. So you will realize that the area of the first block was 40. The area of the second block using the same method, 5 times 6 is 30. And the area of the third block has a width of 5 and a height 7.2. This will give us 36. So using cumulative frequency, we can say that up if we had to add and go, we can say that 100 person lies in the third block because 40 plus 30 is 70 and 70 plus 36 is 106. So we have 70 to 106. That is between here and here. So that's the interval, guys. So that's why I put 70 to 106. And therefore, the first, and also for the top half, we know for the, for the minutes, it's going to be between 26 and 31 because that is the interval time between the time. Yeah. Usually this question is probably a lot easier to do step by step, but the problem with these questions is that they take a long time to evaluate as well. So it's always good to have um, background on this. Now, here comes the main step. So once you fill this up, we're going to use, a, we need to actually convert this into an equation now. Now what I did, I just found proportions. I said that the difference between M and 31 is equal to the difference between 100 and 106. So always line them up neatly. So it's kind of like an art and you get this part. And then you just pick another pair. So what I did, I said uh, 26 take away 31 is proportional to 70 take away 106. And then there we go. And now we just solve this. So you equal this and then you just solve for M and eventually M becomes 30.2. Voila. Now, oh, almost done guys. Now part D is the sum of FX and now this one gave me the most trouble. So X is defined as the midpoint. So for every single interval, we need to find a midpoint. I would actually say put this in the table is easier but for the sake of um, not wasting too much time just I calculate the midpoint each one and said for example between 11 21 the midpoint is 16 between 21 and 26 we get 23.5 and so on and now fx literally just means the frequency the area of the block times the midpoint and we do it for each one and then we sum them up and we should get the total of 6390 ah I know you're thinking, yeah, Yassine's voice sounds so tired. It's actually because it's near the end of the fast and I'm actually recording this during Ramadan. So, <laughs> yeah, I, I'm starting to feel the strain. Now, bear with me guys, we're on the very fine final bit of the, of the question. <laughs> and yeah, this, it goes up to G. So, question A continued. So, given that the sum of F times X squared equals this value, and I thought, you know what, let me copy out the rest of the vital information, the sum of FX, the number, and the median. For the data shown in the histogram, calculate the mean and standard deviation. Now, these are just easy. So the mean is, is the sum of fx, which we have, over n, which is 200. 
and then you get this result 31.95 the standard deviation however is very similar so ignore the square root for a second so if you saw if you if you just simply put the sum of fx squared which is this result over n minus the mean squared this will give you the variance square root and this will give us the standard deviation which is 13.1 so yeah these are self-explanatory i suppose now next one so the coefficient of skewness is given by three times the difference between the mean and median over standard deviation calculate this coefficient of skewness for this data very straightforward just plug in your mean and median and you get 0 0.40 now the manager of the supermarket decides to model these data with a normal distribution now, one thing I'm going to add before I read this, something is normally distributed if the mean equals the median, or if the in other words, is symmetric, it has a symmetrical distribution, or if the skewness is zero, because if you subtract two same values, you get zero. However, this is not zero. Now, comment on the manager's decision. Give a justification for your answer. So the answer is not a normal distribution because mean don't equal median. And that's it. Oh, I'm beat, guys. Well, I hope you enjoyed this video and uh, leave a comment below. Let me know what you think. If you like the idea of me putting solutions ahead of time and just explaining it, like seriously, give me a thumbs up or give me a like. And yeah, feedback is great. Feedback is necessary. So yeah, I'm going to go break my fast. It's iftar time. So see you guys soon. Ciao.